Let's explore how GPU instancing can optimize rendering large number of objects. In this video, we'll cover how GPU instancing works and how to use the Multimesh instance node in Godot to improve performance. I'll demonstrate with my voxel terrain and we'll see how reducing draw calls can boost performance. Finally, we'll discuss the pros and cons and how we might optimize even further. And now let's get started. My current terrain is made of a bunch of CSG Bucks 3D nodes. If I run the project, we can instantly see that the movement is chunky when we're facing most of the world. And from the visual profiler, we can really see that we have a huge problem with the rendering of the terrain. From the monitors tab, we can also see that we have more than 100,000 cubes in the world. And when we view the whole world, we have just as many draw calls. Rendering a single cube can of course be done really fast, but sending data from the CPU to the GPU can easily become a bottleneck for our rendering. Each draw call we make will not only spend time rendering the actual vertices required for the drawing. The CPU will also have to tell the GPU where to find the data, how it should be drawn and so on. So while the actual rendering might be fast, giving the GPU the commands required for the rendering isn't. This is why we usually want to limit the number of draw calls as much as possible. There is of course more than one way of doing this, but in this episode we'll look into GPU instancing. Instancing is a technique that lets us render multiple instances of the same mesh using a single draw call. In later episodes, we'll continue to optimize our voxel terrain using more advanced and custom methods. Using the profiler tools I talked about in the last episode, we will then be able to properly compare how the more custom solutions perform compared to just using instancing. In Godot, we can use the Multimesh Instance 3D node and the Multimesh resource when we want to render using GPU instancing. I've left three links in the description to where you can learn more about Multimesh optimization and animating thousands of fish using Multimesh. So go check those out if you want to dig deeper into Godot's Multimesh after this video. Please note that this solution only handles rendering. Collisions have to be handled in some other way. Now let's start by adding a new Multimesh Instance 3D node to our world scene. And from the Inspector menu, we can then create the Multimesh we'll be using. When we've created the Multimesh, we then need to specify that this is for 3D. A little further down, we can then set the mesh that we we'll want to create a lot of instances of. In our case, we can just select the box mesh. With the new mesh selected, we can also add a standard material and use the albedo color to define a color for the mesh. I'll later show you how we can tell the multi-mesh what color the individual boxes should be, but we'll just start with the same color for all the boxes. Finally, we should also add a reference to our multi-mesh instance at the top of our world script. In the terrain generation we used so far, we just went through every position in our world and added a cube node immediately if the nice value for the position was high enough. But when we use a multi-mesh for our GPU instancing, we first need to set the size of the buffer we'll be using to transfer data from the CPU to the GPU. So we need to know how many instances of the cube mesh we want to draw before we can add any data about each individual instance. Of course, we don't know how many cubes we need before we've gone through all the possible positions in the world and generated the corresponding noise values. So we'll still keep the nested for loops here. However, now we won't create and add a new cube for the positions that requires a cube. Instead, we'll create the first simple data structure for storing voxel data. In later episodes, we can explore more advanced data structures and consider what data we might also want to store. 
But for now, we'll just create an array to store the positions of all the cubes we want to place. Now we can use the size of our data array to set the instance count of our multi-mesh or multi-mesh instance 3D node has. The last thing we now need is to insert all our positions in the buffer for the multi-mesh, so that the GPU will know where to place all our cubes. For this, we can create a new for in range loop and let it go from zero up to the instance count. And then, for each i, we can set the instance transform. This method takes two inputs. The first is the index of the instance, and we can just use i here. Next is the transform that will be used to place this specific cube instance. We'll create this using the identity basis and the position vector stored at index i in our data array. The bases represent rotation, scale, and shear, but since we want none of those, we can just use the identity basis here. I've left a link in the description for those of you who want to read more about bases. Having a decent understanding of metric math will be helpful if you want to dig deeper into all of this. Now, make sure you enable flying by default in the player script, and then let's test and see how this works. Not only is this better for our rendering, it's also much faster to generate. And this is of course because we no longer create a new node and add it as a child of our root node for each queue. We can now fly around in our world with much more ease than before. From the visual profiler, we can also see that the project now runs with no alarming issues, at least on my computer. What world sizes you can run will depend on your hardware, of course, but my PC really isn't that new. And when we go to the monitor tab, we can also note that we have much less nodes and only a single draw call. Another important thing to notice is the primitive strong. You might not have looked closer at this in the previous solution, but when we use our multi-mesh to render all our cubes, this number doesn't change at all. Even if we only look at a small part of the world, the primitives drawn are still the same. And this is important to remember. When we draw our cubes using a single multi-mesh, they will all be drawn together. You either draw none or you draw all. When we used individual nodes for the cubes, Godot automatically makes sure that only the ones we're looking at were rendered. So, if you're using multi-mesh for any parts of your project, you need to keep this in mind. Now, let's disable flying and... Oh, now we're falling directly through our terrain. As I specified earlier, GPU instancing like this only takes care of the rendering part of our terrain, so we don't have any collision. We could try to create a new static body 3D with its own collision shape for each cube like this. And for smaller worlds, this might be fine. But let's see what happens when I try to create a larger world using this method. Before we move on to the conclusions of the experiments from this episode, I first want to show you how we can add different colors to our instances. First, we need to enable the Use Color property on the multi-mesh we created for our multi-mesh instance node. Next, we need to go down to the mesh, open the material we created, locate vertex color and enable Use as Albedo. And then it can also be a good idea to set the albedo color to white, but please experiment with this later and see how the two affect each other. 
Now we're ready to define a color for each instance, but first let's create a few colors to choose from. For this, I'm creating an exported array of colors, and from the inspector menu, I'm then adding four colors to the array. Down, after we set the transform for each instance, we can then set what color the instance should have using the setInstanceColor method. The first argument should be the index number, and the second should then be the color. Here, I'm just selecting a random color from our color array, but please try to use this to experiment with other ways to select the color. And now, our cube should be a little more festive. What did we learn from testing this new solution using GPU instancing, and where should we go from here? Well, first of all, we can confirm that limiting the number of draw calls makes a huge difference. I went from only being able to render a relatively small world to flying around in a notably larger world. However, we still aren't at a place where I would just say, hey, this is fine, let's ship it. There are still so many things we need to consider if we want to make something that's usable for an actual game. First, there's a collision, of course. We need to consider how we can create a solution that also makes it somewhat easy for us to add collision to the world as well. So far, we've also only considered a static terrain, but what if we want to be able to place and remove blocks as well? How can we implement this, and what problems might this cause that we also need to deal with? And what about memory? Is using a plain array a good idea for storing our voxel data? And are there other types of data we need to store besides just the positions? What would we need to change if we wanted an infinite world? There really is so much we can dive into. Next time, I'm thinking we'll look into creating a custom mesh for our terrain and see how this benefits our project, and also how this will compare to using GPU instancing. But please let me know in the comments below what other topics you would like us to dive into later in this series on how to make a voxel terrain in Godot. The project files for this episode is, as always, available through selected tiers and Patreon. I hope you liked this video. And remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell and all that if you want to see more like this in the future. Bye!